Hey, it is great being with you all here in Dallas. And I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, online. We're so happy that uh, you're here and, and hope that you'll give us some feedback on how this worked for you. Really, the only thing that's missing is that we can't see you. So maybe we need to work on that uh, going forward. You know, VLC is a great opportunity for us to come together, uh, celebrate our achievements. We've heard a little bit about that already from Mike. Honor leaders in our community and brainstorm how we can work together to have an even greater impact uh, in the year ahead. But even more important than that, it's a time for us at the CF Foundation to thank you for another amazing year. So thank you for everything that you do to make a difference in the lives of people with CF. You are an amazing group, and we thank you for everything that you do to make all of this work possible. Um, this year is going to be amazing. Uh, Maureen and Molly and their wonderful team have worked overtime to put together an outstanding program. You're going to love it. And this is the first year, the first VLC for Mark Ginsky, our new EVP and chief operating officer. Now, some of you have met Mark because he's been flying all over the country. He's really travel worn, uh, uh, to say the least, but he's enjoyed it. And some of you haven't met Mark yet, and you're wondering, well, what, what's he like? I, you know, who is this guy? He's a great guy. You're going to love him. We're so thrilled to have him on board at the CF Foundation, and he's going to be like a kid in a candy shop throughout the whole VLC, and you're going to love getting to know him. So enjoy Mark, and I think Mark's going to talk to you all in just a minute. So I'm going to transition and just talk a little bit about the future and a couple of opportunities, and let me start by thanking you for making the cystic fibrosis story the most amazing story in medicine today. Let me say that again. Thank you for making the cystic fibrosis story the most amazing story in medicine today. That's really saying something. <laughs> and it's because of you all. There was a time, though, when there was no hope for people with CF and their families. Today we have hope, and the reason we have hope is because the community, you all, have been strong and united throughout the journey that we've all taken to end this, end this disease. Together we created the best care center network in the world for any chronic disease. We unraveled the science, and then we translated that science into new therapies that treated both the complications of cystic fibrosis and therapies that address the basic defect. The median survival has gone from less than five years of age to in the 40s. And while this is, represents real improvement, it's obviously not good enough. So that begs the question, where are we going? What does the future look like? And I'm happy to report that um, last week we had great news from Vertex uh, with the Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, Faith, phase three trials. And if you're not used to that term, this was previously known as VX661. So the VX661 stories that Mike and others have been showing you slides on is Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. And this is important for a number of reasons that Mike will go over in a minute. But let me just mention one now. It's important for the future. Uh, about eight years ago, Chris Penland and, and others led the science to sort of help us understand that the folding of the most common mutation, f 508 del is a multi-step process. And if you have one corrector that attacks one piece of that process, you get significant improvement. And if you have another corrector that addresses another step in that process, you get pretty significant improvement. But if you put them together, you have amazing improvement. It's sort of like one plus one equals five. Now I can add, it's like one plus one equals five because it gives you greater than their individual benefits uh, together. And so why am, I, why am I telling you this? The point that I want you to understand is that Tezacaftor is unlike Lumacaftor, is that first corrector. And in four or five years, when the next gen programs, Mike, are you going to talk about those? Uh, when 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 we're uh, when we talk about the when four or five years, when the next gen compounds come out and are added to Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, 
the benefit that people with CF will receive if they have one or two F508 Dell mutations is going to be really remarkable. And so those with one CF mutation with F508 Dell that don't have any treatments now will have an amazing treatment. And the reason I'm telling you that is that that will go will mean that we've gone from 4% initially with Ivacaptor to 8% to 58% with Orcombi, or Combi will be replaced, 65% when we add the residual function, and then to 95%. But even that isn't the reason that I'm telling you. The reason I'm telling you this is that with that level of efficacy for all of those people, we will not expect their median survival to be in the 40s as it is today, not even in the 50s not even in the 60s, but we expect their median survival will be in the 70s and the 80s. Think about that. Now, Vertex is doing a fabulous job, and they're certainly going to be first up, but there's a lot of other programs, and they have some very exciting stuff, and they may even raise the level of efficacy for for that population, but it'll still be at 95%. So what about that last 5%? Do we forget them? No, we absolutely cannot forget them. We will make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. We will get to 100%. But how do we do that? Do we have a plan? And I'm happy to report that Bill and his team have been working hard on the plan so Bill Skatz, the leader of our research programs at the CF Foundation, has built a very important nonsense screening mutation because while 10% of our population have nonsense mutations, that will, effective treatment for them will move us from, from 95% to 98%. And so we're very excited about that. But that leaves us with 2% that are going to be very complicated to treat. And that's why we've been investing already and messenger RNA and DNA replacement therapies that will be mutation agnostic to allow those patients to have very effective treatments. So we will reach 100%. But even when we reach 100%, we will not be done. Because as Mike alluded to earlier, there are people with very established disease that have other needs as well beyond just CFTR modulation. That's why in our pipeline today we have a greater emphasis on better novel mechanism of action antimicrobials, anti-inflammatories, better mucociliary clearance drugs than ever before so that those people will be able to also live full and productive lives. And so if we're at 100% and they have all the other therapies that, they're leave, that, that they need and we believe that they can leave, lead full and productive lives, are we done then? We're not even done at that point. And the reason is, is that our mission, our mission is what? What is our mission? Well, our mission is to cure cystic fibrosis. And so we believe the science is there for us today to dream. And so we're dreaming of a day that an individual can go into clinic with cystic fibrosis, get a treatment for gene editing, and leave without cystic fibrosis. Isn't that great? Now that may seem absolutely stark raving mad, and Bill reminds me of that occasionally. <laughs> but the science is there, and, we're, and we, we believe that we have to have those bold dreams because we think it is possible. But it, just to be fair, it's 20 years away. We've got a lot of work to do. But what Bill Skatch and his team are doing, so they're bringing the best scientists, the best technology in the world together, assembling these teams to begin to make sure that we accelerate this as fast as possible. And the good news is, is that the unbelievable team in Boston and our CFFT lab are focused on this as well as the nonsense mutations as well. Now, if you didn't understand anything that I just said, it doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is that Bill and Mike are gonna follow me and they'll do a much better job of it, sort of explaining this and you'll have a chance to answer questions. But I have to just say, as I move on, how fortunate we are to have incredible team members across the CF Foundation. But as I look down and I see Bruce Marshall, I think of the amazing job that he's done with our Care Center Network 
over the years. Absolutely the best care center network in the world for any chronic disease. And Bruce has been very busy bringing in mental health initiatives. He's more than doubled in the last several years. The funding for our care centers because our care teams needed that support to provide the help the uh, care that they needed. And I'm looking around for Mary Dwight. How fortunate we are to have Mary. Where's Mary? Oh, wait. We didn't, we didn't invite Mary to... <laughs> Mary's at the children's table at Thanksgiving, way back there <laughs> in the back. So uh, how fortunate we are to have Mary leading our policy and access programs. Uh, they are phenomenal. Last month, we had the largest March on the Hill ever. Over 100 advocates had over 300 meetings with representatives on the Hill telling the White House and Congress what people with CF need. You know, we're apolitical, but we're going to fight fiercely for the rights for pe people with cystic fibrosis to make sure that they have affordable, available, and adequate coverage for people with CF. And you're going to hear from Bruce and Mary and Drusy Borowitz, which I'll talk about in just a second, at tomorrow morning session. Is it tomorrow morning? Uh, so you have to, you have to, I don't care what you do tonight, you have to get up for that, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, if it's a long night, good for you. Just make sure you pace yourself so you can be here in the morning for that, for that session. But here's the main takeaway that I want you to know. You all have enabled this. You all have enabled this. None of this would have happened without you all. You have brought hope to the CF community when there was no hope. You have enabled the fundraising that has fueled our medical gains. You are responsible for the unprecedented opportunities and for the hope that we have in fulfilling an even greater uh, place going forward. So thank you. And I just want to tell you that our future looks very, very bright. Now I want to end with Two opportunities. One relates to Drusy Borowitz, Dr. Borowitz, who you'll meet tomorrow. Is Drusy here? We've had a lot of flight problems. Is Dr. Can you, where's Drusy? Oh, she's at the other child's table in the back. <laughs> obviously, obviously Bruce didn't get the message that he needed to sit in the, in the back of the room. But, uh, uh, Drusy Borowitz is one of my heroes. And, uh, she's leading our community partnerships program which is really doing a beautiful thing in that basically they're listening to people with CF, using that very valuable resource to determine how we can do things better at the CF Foundation in many ways, but also in programs to meet their needs. And they've done some neat things already, and I won't steal her thunder, but peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and very novel uh, uh, get-togethers using uh, technology. So it's just really... I think changing the foundation and, and who we are. The other thing that I just will end with is that I think we can, the other opportunity is that we can do a better job of communicating to you all. And we're, you're going to see real evidences of that over the year to come because I'm, I'm astounded at times when I go out and people say, why aren't you doing anything for nonsense mutations? Or you haven't really been, you haven't really changed your funding paradigm since the monetization. And I'm just thinking, wow, we really need to do a better job of communicating what we're doing. And so we think that your partners, we want to share the information, including being very transparent in how we spend our money, but we also want to let you know the successes and the progress that we're making so that you're able to write those letters for Great Strides and everything else that you, as you talk to friends, so that you know as a partner where we are and what we're doing. So let me end with just a couple of did you knows here to sort of highlight this point. As far as the acceleration of the work that we're doing, uh, the progress is just rapidly accelerating. And just to highlight a couple of things to make that point, did you know in 2012, you have to remember a number here, 2012, the medical scientific budget in the CF Foundation was 87 million. So 87 million in 2012. This year, it's $181 million, right? I mean... Bill did not have gray hair <laughs> when he came to the CF Foundation. And one of the reasons he has gray hair is that in 2012, we had 
500 funded research grants. How many do you think we had last year? 1,700. More than triple the number of grants. Um, guys, I cannot tell you how different, how different the progress is going, going forward. And this is kind of neat. You know, Bob and I used to sit around and kind of look for people who'd come in and talk to us, you know, that had a company and maybe, how many com companies do you think that we met with last year? Five, 10, 30, 50. We met with 130 companies last year. Yeah. I'm going to steal a saying. Is it okay if I steal your saying? So I'm going to steal something from Mike Boyle, which I just absolutely love. He says, we have to kiss a lot of frogs to find the prince or princess, you know? And that's what we're doing when we meet with all these companies. I think we we funded about 37 of them uh, last year. Uh, but Bill will correct me if I got that wrong. And did you know that the nonsense screening mutation that Bill and Chris and others have put together is probably the most robust nonsense screening program for any disease in the country, in the world? And we've committed, uh, how many millions of dollars, Bill, have we committed to nonsense screening? So, uh, 20 million, and how, if we add, if we add the, uh, agnostic approaches, it goes to how much? 62 million. So, 62 million, if you take all approaches for, uh, nonsense screening, we've committed, uh, 62 million dollars, uh, for the nonsense programs. And then I just have to give another shout out to Bruce and his team. Uh, did you know that we were the first to develop a mental health program for people who are struggling with a chronic illness and their families? And a shout out to Mary and uh, her team and who have built Compass into an unbelievable resource for people with CF. They're touching the lives of people. And did you know since rebranding of Compass over a year ago, I think it's grown by some ridiculous number like 40%. But there, that number doesn't do it justice because what it's doing is it's helping people live better todays and actually unraveling the maze of access to care so that people can get the things that they need to live full and productive lives. So our future is bright. Our mission is cure. We want to cure cystic fibrosis. It is an ambitious goal, but I think that with all of you, we're going to be successful. And I look forward to spending time with you all over the next couple of days, brainstorming how we can do a better job of doing that in the future. So thank you all, and you're a lot of fun to be with. So thank you very much. <laughs> now we're going to rotate into our, our research uh, presentation from Dr. Bill Sketch and Michael Boyle, uh, and I'll give a brief introduction to them uh, and to say they come from incredible pedigrees. Uh, Bill has been at... Uh, Harvard, UCSF, and Oregon. Mike's full career has been at Hopkins. Uh, they're world renowned in their respective fields. Bill is a, uh, as a scientist in, in protein folding and other things, but if I told you what the other things were, you wouldn't understand it, so I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> Mike, as most of you know, is one of the world renowned adult providers for CF, but more importantly for us, He's recognized world over as a leader in clinical trials and was, in fact, the principal investigator in the Orcombi trials and has been leading our therapeutics development network. Uh, they're both extremely hardworking. One of the things that I worry about them is that we're going to burn them out. So uh, they, they work way too hard. What I love about both of them, and in fact, our whole team across the CF Foundation, is their heart. And they're doing this because they want to make a difference in the lives of people with CF. And just to give you a little personal note for each of them, so that you, it's nice to have a little relational tag. Bill Sketch, uh, I could tell you so many things like this on Bill Sketch, it's not funny, but here's a quick one. Uh, Bill Sketch taught himself how to hang glide. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? Hey, I think I'm going to go out and hang glide today. <laughs> so that's great. And uh, a, a little more, a little more family oriented for Mike. Uh, you might catch Mike on the sidelines of Johns Hopkins lacrosse uh, games uh, in the spring because it's his daughter, a freshman. 
uh, actually starts for them. And uh, that's an outstanding team. So Mike is out there supporting. And he's learned, because the team comes to his house, he, he has, has learned what all of the, uh, what's the name of the movie, the, the show? The Bachelor. So he watches The Bachelor. <laughs> Bill, do you want to come? Do you want to come up? <laughs> thank you, Preston. That was really kind. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's really hard to follow Preston because he's he's so eloquent. And what I'm going to do is kind of now tell you a little bit about what we do in the medical group. It's such an honor to be here and have this opportunity. But first, I just have to say that we couldn't do anything. We wouldn't be here. We would be doing really very, very little without all the effort that everyone in this room puts in day after day, year after year. And we really are one team. Preston introduced some of these topics so I can go through them fairly quickly. But I went back a little further. In 1998, the medical budget was only $27 million. And now this year it's 160. Next year it's predicted, uh, last year it was 160. This year it's predicted to be 180. And what that really means is that we have an enormously expanded research scope. We have new areas of research that we're pursuing, a broad range of therapeutic approaches, and really a greater variety of clinical needs. So normally in these kind of sessions, we give a few tidbits of what we're working on and some real highlights, but I want to start by giving, stepping back a little bit and giving you a bit of an overview. Because I don't know about you, but I don't really know what $180 million is. What can you really do with $180 million? So if we take a look at how this breaks down, we have three arms of the medical group, really. Therapeutics development, which is really Mike Boyle's area, the clinical trials and TDN, Therapeutics Development Network, really bringing drugs to people in the clinic. Research affairs, which my great team is, is uh, honored to, to work at. We do basic research, preclinical research, and we work with these companies that Preston talked about, together with Mike, bringing new therapies into the clinic. And the care centers, which, is really, which are really uh, manned and, and overseen by Bruce Marshall, has really built up, as Preston said, the best care centers in history. And if we look at the numbers, all three of these arms have grown over the last five years. We were at $104 million in 2013. We're at 181 projected dollars in 2017. The research arm has almost doubled. The support to the care centers has almost tripled. And the therapeutics development has increased as well. So let's just take a look at therapeutics development and research affairs, because Bruce will talk about the clinical care centers later in the meeting. That's about $125 million. So where are we putting that money? We think since you worked so hard to raise these resources for us, we should let you know where we're going because that will help you tell our story and your story to the community. So the biggest piece of this pie is preventing CF complications. It's not CF term modulators. It's really the nuts and bolts of where we got today. How do we make people live better lives and as Mike said, simpler lives. Next is CFTR modulation, $28 million to continue our work and ensure that CFTR modulators come forward. Clinical research support. This is a very large area. The Therapeutics Development Network, as well as certain observational clinical trials that are run by the academic centers. Basic research support. These are our research and development programs at academic institutions, animal models, cell lines, all the kinds of research that we need in order to bring these therapies forward that support academic researchers and companies. CFTR restoration looks pretty small. Right now, this is our nonsense RNA therapy and delivery program, uh, RNA therapy and RNA editing programs, $5 million. But a few years ago, this was zero. And next year, it's going to be much bigger. So these areas now are actually growing a lot. The one-time cure the Preston talked about, Curing CF once and for all, $4 million this year, but I'll show you a slide later how much this is growing. And finally, the CFFT lab up in Lexington run by Martin Mensa. This was started in 2012 as a very small operation with just three people. It now has 26 people, a $6 million budget, and it's really doing some great things and nonsense mutations in gene editing and stem cell research that you'll hear about later in the meeting. So if we just take a look at CF complications, <clears throat> We have $36, $37 million, broken down into a couple of main areas. We have 
78 projects trying to identify how to better treat infectious complications of CF. These are basic projects looking at biofilms, looking at viruses, viral, viral bacterial interactions. These are clinical trials looking at how we can better treat Burkholderia, multidrug resistant pseudomonas, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, really tough organisms that we need to treat because those are the kinds of problems that the CF community is now facing. Inflammation. This is really what damages the lung. The infection sets up a cycle. The inflammation then secretes these degrading enzymes. Lung damage and scarring occurs. We have 35 programs that are looking at inflammation, looking at cellular signaling pathways, looking at compounds and molecules that are involved in, in those types of abnormalities in the lung that damage the airways and damage the parenchyma, cause the, cause the strictures, and actually accelerate then the cycle of infection. But in addition, we have 12 clinical programs that are bringing brand new therapies to the clinic, and Mike will tell you a little bit about those in just a minute. Mucus and airway clearance, 37 programs. These are looking at how mucus is secreted, what are the abnormalities of that mucus? What type of cells, the goblet cells? How do they make that mucus and get it into the airway? What are the effects of the pH, the acidity of the airway, on how that mucus behaves? And eight clinical studies that are looking at ways we might break down that mucus and thin it out so it's passed better through the airways, and also better ways of hydrating, better ways of hydrating the airways so that we can now, together by thinning the mucus and providing more liquid, have that move out more effectively. We have 26 programs on GI and nutrition, diabetes, and endocrinology. What is the best nutritional programs? How can we help young children gain weight, maintain their weight? In a brand new area that we're just starting is lung transplantation. We already have 21 programs that we're funding, and two years ago we really had essentially none. So this is a very large rapid growth. We recognize lung transplants are a critical component of certain members of our community. We want to make sure that they have better access to transplant. We want to make sure we have better therapies for transplant. And very importantly, we want to understand why lung transplants do not behave as well, do not last as long, and have more problems than kidney transplants or heart transplants. And this is fundamental to our mission. So what does all this mean? These are therapies that don't care about what mutation you inherited. These are therapies that can benefit everyone. And our goal is really to preserve lung function and maintain health in the community for as long as absolutely possible so that when those therapies come that will be mutation specific, the people living now will be able to take advantage of them. So this is an absolutely critical, critical part of our mission. I want to say a brief word about CFTR modulators, and Mike's going to talk more about the clinical aspects of this. We have 75 projects that are working on CFTR modulators. Basic researchers studying protein structure, protein function, all the kind of aspects of how the proteins fold, traffic through the cell, looking at various mutations, how modulators can impact those mutations. We have studies like Goal and Prospect that are actually asking, how well do people do when they get put on Kaleidico, when they get put on Arcambi? We follow them along, we understand what the real benefits are, what the limitations are, and how we can better measure those kinds of, those kinds of things and the supporting science, really the basic research that has got us to where we are now with CFTR modulators, we're still continuing, and we have almost 60 programs in the basic research area. So I want to give you one example of a very exciting discovery, at least exciting for the research community. So for 25 years, we've been trying to understand the structure of this protein. It's a very complicated protein. It's not very stable. It's hard to isolate. And last December, the very first paper by Zhu Chen's research group at Rockefeller University published the structure of the zebrafish CFTR. Now, zebrafish. <laughs> so I really like the bags with the candles. And what we thought about doing is putting little bags of zebrafish on the table that you could all take home with you. But the TSA didn't like that idea because many of us will be flying out. But as you look at your aquarium and you see that little striped tiny fish about two inches long, that was the breakthrough. Scientists are kind of weird like that. The zebrafish CFTR, it turns out, is really easy to synthesize. It's much more easy to purify. And so Jews' group started working on this protein along with the human protein. And basically, I was talking to her just last week in Europe, ironed out all the details of how to purify it, how to get it on the grids, how to take the pictures, and how to solve the structure. It took her about a year and a half to do that. 
Once they had solved that structure, it took them about three months to do the human CFTR. And that structure just came out two weeks, two weeks ago. There are more structures on the way, and these structures are going to tell us several really critical and important things. So this is movies, and you have to watch this quickly. These are two different confirmations of CFTR. And what we can now start to do is actually ask, how does the protein move while it's opening and closing to process chloride and move chloride through the, through the membrane? So these structures are going to help us a lot in understanding how the protein functions. But more importantly, they now allow us to take a look at a variety of mutations and show where are they sitting on that protein. How do those mutations work? How do they block function? And a really important goal is now to find out where do the drugs bind? Where does Kaleidico bind CFTR? What pocket does it sit in? And how does sitting in that pocket change the gating of the protein so that now G551D patients, people with CF, can actually walk around, breathe, and live much more healthy lives? So it starts out in a very small laboratory, has huge implications for everything we're doing now at CF, and this is just one example. Now Preston talked about the modulators and where we're going. Mike's going to talk about it, and I'm just going to show this, this brief diagram of kind of where we are today. So as Preston said, lumacaftor, ivacaftor, the combination being or can be, is available and will help, we think, about 46% of all the people with CF. Ivacaftor, which is Kaleidico, will help right now about 8% of people with CF. So we're in the 50s. We think that there's about another 4% of people that carry gating mutations that will benefit from Kaleidico that we don't yet have it approved for. Some of those mutations were, we know. Some of those are tations, mutations we're still looking to find out. The big breakthrough will happen when the second generation modulators come through that will extend this number to people with only one copy of f 508 del And that will bring us to about 95%. And we're looking down the pipeline of how this is going to happen. Mike's going to talk about that in a few minutes. But this leaves us with a real conundrum. 5% of people we know won't respond to these modulators because they don't make a full-length CFTR protein. So how do we develop alternative therapies for the last 5%? And what's really nice here is that I think if we can develop alternative therapies for the last 5%, we can make better therapies for everyone else. So it's not just about the last 5%, but that will transform the way we treat CF in the future. So what are we doing? Well, I'm going to get a little into the weeds here because these are some really exciting things which are now just coming forward. For many years, Chris Penland has been funding a group at Johns Hopkins University, and they've started a program called CFTR 2.0. Their task is to identify all the mutations in CFTR in the world. And they now have a list of 88,000 patients from 40 countries and five continents. And on that list are about 1,700 mutations. And we think that short of China and India, this is pretty much most, if not all, the mutations in the world, except for maybe 25 or 30, based on the numbers. So that's a great starting point, because now we can ask, what do these mutations do? How do they work? It's a little surprising to me that about half of those mutations, about 800, cause the CFTR protein not to be synthesized. None of those mutations, or very few of them, respond to modulators. The other 900 still generate a full-length or a near-full-length protein. And 660 of these, roughly, change a very small part of that protein, much like f 508 del We know that some of these mutations will respond to the drugs we already have available, or Cambian Kaleidico. So one of our goals is to make sure we can bring those drugs to the right people. So how can we figure out how drugs will affect people? Because there are very, very few people with many of these mutations. You can't run randomized clinical trials if you only have five people in the world that have a specific mutation. So Mike has been working with the FDA. We've been working with the scientists. And we've come up with a term that's called therotype. And I think this was actually coined by Phil Thomas and Gary Cutting. What it means is we use laboratory data to predict which people will respond to drugs. And then we take that to the clinic, test that out, and move those people onto therapies. 
Now, there's nothing new about this. We've been doing this for the last probably 15 to 20 years, and we've called them human bronchial airway cells. When a transplant occurs, we're very active at collecting those cells from the transplanted, from the lungs which came out of the, of the CF individual, growing them in the clinic, growing them in the laboratory, and then testing compounds. And this really was the way we drove the discovery processes for Kaleidico and Orcambi. But transplanted lungs are very, very hard to get from people with rare mutations because they're rare. So we're now approaching a whole series of processes <laughs> to find out ways of testing cells other than cells that don't come from transplanted lungs. So one process is to just make all 650 mutations, which have a very small change in the protein, test them all in the laboratory, and find out which ones respond and which ones don't. And I can say that probably everyone in this room is wondering, what about my mutation? What about my family's mutation? I can pretty much assure you that it's on that list of the 1,728, and that we are working very hard to find out as much as we can about every single mutation. We're holding a therotyping workshop this spring. We've invited the FDA to come to really try to sort out some of these difficult questions about how we're moving forward in this area. Here's one example. This is a process that was developed by Jeff Beekman in the Netherlands. You can take a small biopsy from an intestine, and then you can take the cells from that biopsy and grow them in the laboratory. And it's really pretty amazing, because they just grow and grow and grow and grow. They never stop. Now the cells, when they're grown in a certain way, form little balls. And in the center of those balls is a little cavity. And the cells are aligned so that when CFTR is activated, they secrete fluid into that cavity. So now you can take cells from various patients, and in this case it's from someone with f 5 8 del two copies of f 5 8 del and you can add stimulators of CFTR, and you can show that if you have the mutation, they don't swell very much. But if you first treat those cells with a combination of VX809 and VX770, which are the components that went into Orcambi, and then activate CFTR, you can see they swell a lot. And you can measure the swelling, and you can characterize how well a particular mutation responds to things like Orcambi and Kaleidico in the laboratory. So these cells can be acquired from a variety of individuals, and there's a group in the Netherlands that now has a bank of about 130 cells. We're developing those banks here in the U.S., and we're using these cells now to try to understand how will they correlate with the bronchial epithelial cells that we've been using in the past, and how will they predict response in the future. This is some very early data, and what it shows is, on the left-hand side, as the swelling goes up, you see on the bottom that you now have increased function. And these are exactly the kinds of data that we need to move forward with the FDA, with the scientific and clinical community, to say, this is a, this is a kind of test that may be useful in bringing these, these modulator drugs to all individuals that will benefit. So this is a spoiler alert, because if you want to know more about this, Dr. Catherine Tuggle will be here tomorrow at one of the breakout sessions. And she's going to give a brief presentation, and you'll have a chance to ask questions and learn more. So then we're stuck with these people. That's a bad way to put it. <laughs> so now we have to tackle the very important question. <laughs> it's a bad save, actually. What about people that don't make CFGR protein? We can now go to our database. There's 177 different nonsense mutations. There's 116 people that have, there's 116 types of splicing defects. There's 424 different types of frame shifts and 106 large deletions of the gene. 5% of people that we're talking about really carry only these kinds of mutations. They don't carry an F508 on their other gene. And what's really amazing is 1,000 or more of these mutations occur in less than five people in the world. So it's a whole different way of thinking about how we're going to solve this problem. And we started a, an initiative a couple of years ago called the Nonsense and Rare Mutation Initiative to tackle this problem specifically. This involves looking for drugs that specifically will read through and correct nonsense mutations, as well as other areas that Preston mentioned about RNA-directed therapy, about gene editing and gene delivery. And to start this, you find the science. We put out requests for applications. We now have funded a number of these programs, 
in nonsense drug discovery, mRNA therapy, gene editing, and the total that we have going forward is up to 62 million. And what's important about this is it's growing very rapidly as the technology expands. Our goal with nonsense mutations is to effectively treat individuals that are unresponsive to CFTR modulators. We've met with nine companies to date. We have, we're working actively with several of them. Some of them have sent us their compounds. We're testing them. We've advised companies in this area. And this involves small molecules, aminoglycosides or an antibiotic like tobramycin and gentamicin that, that also can have effect on nonsense mutations. We're looking at RNA modification. We're looking at RNA stability and, stability and expression, and also tRNA approaches, very novel approaches to try to overcome these problems. I think we all heard about the PTC, Therapeutics Phase Three clinical trial. I think it was disappointing. We were all hoping that would be positive. We knew that the results would be reported this year, and when they were finally reported as negative, I think it was a blow to the community. But even before those results were reported, four years ago, we were already planning on what happens if that trial turns out to be negative. And we started a pilot project with Southern Research Institute that grew into a much larger project in 2015 that I'll talk about next. We also said to the CFTR laboratory, let's start focusing on nonsense mutations. Let's try to understand how we can put our expertise to work with the companies that are interested in this space. So Southern Research Institute is a nonprofit organization with a half a million square feet of laboratory space that is solely dedicated to discovering new drugs and bringing them forward into the clinic. What was really nice is we started this program in 2015. They have already completed screening, 770,000 compounds, three quarters of a million compounds. And what has come out of that screen so far has been absolutely amazing. They found hundreds of molecules that were active against nonsense mutations. They went back and re-screened those, and they have 170 different molecules now in their pipeline. They have over almost 30 different types of molecules that act by different mechanisms that, that affect the nonsense mutations in different ways. And now the process is to take those molecules, work with them, make them more potent, and turn them into drugs. And that's exactly what they're doing. The CFTR lab is doing similar work on a different set of compounds. They've screened approximately 200,000 compounds so far and have also found many, many active, active compounds. What's really nice is many of those compounds are much more active than adalorin, which was the PTC drug. So we're starting at a higher bar. We're starting at a higher level. We know we need to do that. This is just a little bit of data, and I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but just to say we're testing these compounds on multiple nonsense mutations to see how they translate. Y122X, G542X, W1282X, some of you might recognize those. These are different types of nonsense mutations that occur in different parts of the CFTR gene. And what's really interesting is molecules don't act the same. We now know that some molecules work better on Y122 than they do on 1252 or 1282. And so we can now start to really look for molecules that work across the spectrum or hone in on certain mutations and make sure that those are the ones that we can then move forward. So we have different mutation, different responses for different mutations. We've also learned that after you add a nonsense compound, you oftentimes get more activity when you also add a modulator, like Ivacaftor or the combination of Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor. And that, again, changes our way of thinking. We're looking, again, now down the road at combinations of drugs that will give us functional CFTR responses for these individuals with these type of mutations. I'm going to end here with the one-time cure. Preston introduced it. Our goal here is a long-term permanent restoration of CFTR function in everyone with CF. Five years ago, I don't think we even could have said this was possible. And what's happened in the technological space, in the scientific community, has really made us think this has tremendous potential. And we would be <coughs> foolish not to get started looking at this now. It's moving forward in a number of different diseases. We want CF to be one of those diseases, and we're working very hard to make that happen. We put $15 million into this starting in 2015 already, looking at gene expression, gene editing, gene delivery, stem cell biology. We had 100 applications come in in response to our request. We funded 50 research laboratories in this area. We've met with 14 companies, and we have funded programs with four of them. So it's early. It's just getting started. We think this will grow much like the modulators grew over the last 20 years, but very, very exciting. So the one-time cure, 
it involves two things. Replacing DNA so that the CFTR can be synthesized and repairing DNA so the CFTR can be synthesized from its own gene. And I want to just show a video here because I think this kind of gives you a sense of what we're really talking about. And this is a video that was put together. Some of you may have seen it at the plenaries, but it's so cool, I just couldn't help but show it again. <laughs> In cystic fibrosis, thick, sticky mucus presses down on cilia inside the lungs, preventing the cilia from beating and clearing the mucus. The cause of this problem is an abnormal CFTR protein created from genetic mutations inside the cell nucleus. Our goal is to replace and repair the abnormal DNA sequence to create a functional protein and restore normal mucus. One way to do this is to use gene editing technologies that cut out and replace defective parts of DNA, such as CRISPR-Cas9. The CRISPR-Cas9 repair system has three components. A guide RNA that seeks out and binds to a specific location in the DNA. The Cas9 nuclease enzyme, a type of molecular scissors that cuts the genetic sequence at the precise binding site. And a repair template containing the correct genetic sequence for the gene. Once these three components are introduced into the cell, the guide RNA binds to and activates the Cas9 nuclease. Now the Cas9 nuclease, the molecular scissors, can search the cell's DNA for potential targets. At a potential target site, like the one shown here, Cas9 unwinds a section of DNA to see if the guide RNA sequence matches. If the DNA sequence matches the guide RNA, the Cas9 nuclease cuts the DNA to create a break in the strands. To replace the mutation with a normal sequence, a repair process is used that precisely edits the DNA. For this editing process to work, a short piece of DNA template that contains the desired normal gene sequence is introduced into the cell. The cell uses this fragment as a template and copies the new sequence as it repairs the broken DNA. Once the first strand has been repaired, the template falls away and the other strand of DNA uses the repaired strand to fill in the remaining gap, leaving both strands with the corrected gene sequence. The cell then uses the corrected DNA strand to produce a functional CFTR protein that allows the proper flow of salt and fluids through the cell membrane. Mucus returns to normal within the lung, allowing the cilia to beat freely and clear the lungs of germs and irritants. So how cool is that? I think in the interest of time, I will just let you know that we're going to have a stem cell session also together with Catherine Tuggle's session by Dr. Jed Mahoney. Jed works at the CFFT lab. He's one of the most dynamic speakers you'll ever hear, and I really recommend he will talk about how we're using the gene editing technology up in the lab and also looking around for the academic community and through, through companies. Um, the only thing I want to let, let you end with is here. And that is, we can use gene editing in several ways. What they showed, what we showed in this movie was fixing a specific site. If we were going to do that, we would need to have 1,700 different types of therapies, one for each mutation. But there are also ways to use gene editing to go after clusters of mutations, where a single therapy could impact dozens or even hundreds of mutations at once. <laughs> and what we're working on now is a way to take one therapy and correct 99.99% of all CF mutations. And we think that is going to be a very powerful approach. So we won't need to walk through every single mutation. It won't matter what mutation you have. We'll be able to go in and change the sequence back to normal for every single person with CF. And I'm going to end there and turn it over to Mike Boyd. <laughs> No.
I know that you all are dying to ask questions, so let me tell you how we're going to do that. Um, the question submission is online, and it is at cff.cnf.io. Do we have it? Oh, we have it here. So there you go. So does anyone understand how to do that? <laughs> Cam, Cam can explain that to us later, if need be. Now, Mike. Great. All right. Well, good afternoon. And uh, Bill, thank you. That was great. I have a funny, funny story as Bill was, was talking. I... Uh, we did a similar tag team presentation about a year ago, and it was also online. And um, when I got home that night, my wife said, hey, I watched the online session. That was an amazing talk. And I said, oh, thank you. And she said, well, actually, I meant Bill's talk. And I, was like, <laughs> I said, all right, I'll try to pick it up. All right. So, um, you know, Preston said this is uh, the best story in medicine. And it's almost easy to say that, right? There's a lot of a lot of people could stand at the, the mic and say, oh, this is, this is the best story in medicine. But in cystic fibrosis, it's really true. And what I wanted to do in the next 15 or 20 minutes was to give the specifics of why that story is true. Okay, to go through and, and, and to do that um, and actually go through a top 10. There's, there's almost no other or very few other diseases where every year you can meet and say, hey, here's all the things that have happened in the last year. Right? For a lot of diseases, it's the same story or a little incremental changes. But in CF, literally, we had to decide, okay, what, what are the things we're going to rank as the highest? And so I picked this as my top 10. And hopefully there'll be something in here for everybody that'll, that'll touch somebody that you, you care for a lot. Um, so number 10, like any good countdown, we're going to go 10 and count up. But number 10, I actually said CFF takes on lung transplantation. Now, this is not a true research topic, although research is included. But we know that that lung transplantation is an, a, a very important issue for the CF community. There's over 1,500 people with CF who are status post lung transplant. There's another 200 to 225 lung transplants every year. And we know that the outcomes aren't good enough. Obviously, they give a second chance at life for many people, but we want to have the outcomes be even better. So this past uh, two years, in particular, the foundation has made a real commitment in this area. This is a new area for the foundation. And Joe Paluski and Al Farrow, who I'm, I think he's in the room somewhere, but I know he's actually giving a session on this tomorrow, um, are leading an effort to take on all different aspects of lung transplantation. This is something we actually announced, uh, we got a lot of attention, we actually announced at the White House a little while ago, this commitment of $15 million over the next couple of years. Um, and how are we doing that? Part of it's by getting a group of centers that are, are gonna be committed to developing expertise, they already are very good at this, but really focusing on providing the best care possible and the best uh, treatment approaches to people with cystic fibrosis undergoing lung transplant. We know we've had success in this in CF and other ways. Uh, Dr. Bruce Marshall has done an amazing job on the Care Center Network, and we'd like to take some of those principles and apply it to lung transplants. So some of this will be standardized and improving lung transplant clinical care. Some of this is gonna be research and chronic rejection, which is one of the real challenges. Some of this is transplant clinical trials. Bill mentioned as well basic research, that there are numerous aspects. So part of this would be the research part, improving the care part, uh, new transplant therapies, some of the immunosuppressives we'd like to investigate. But there's a whole nother other, another part that you will hear about tomorrow from other people that talks about ways that we're trying to, to decrease waiting time by increasing the organ, uh, the number of organ donors and providing support for people as they go through the process and also to help with the financial issues that always occur when there's such a complicated time. So if this is, if number 10 is really your number one, make sure you go see Dr. Al Farrow's lung transplant breakout session. He's going to go through all the details on this. But this is, this is certainly something that we consider to be in our top ten. Number nine is actually a new one. Uh, we don't, haven't been talking about it as much, and that's mucociliary clearance, new mucociliary clearance approaches. We all know if you're involved with CF, this is a lot of what we focus on, whether it's airway clearance, whether it's you know, taking medicines which break up mucus, those type of things. But there's some new approaches which may allow better mucociliary clearance in CF than ever before. I'm gonna show you a very short video which shows, it's a, it's a cartoon, it's a, you know, a simulation of the lining of the lung. It shows the cilia and the mucus that's there, and we always tend to focus just on CFTR. 
That's the channel that the bill was just talking about that balances the salt and water um, in the lining of our lungs. But we know that in cystic fibrosis, that airway surface liquid layer becomes dehydrated. And part of that is because of the cystic fibrosis protein not working well. But part of it is actually because of another channel that's controlled by CFTR called ENAC, or the epithelial sodium channel. And you'll see here in this simulation, the orange is the CFTR not working, but look at the other channel, the ENAC. It is pulling sodium, it's hyperactive, pulling sodium out of the airway and dehydrating the airways. We think that this certainly can contribute, at least it does in animal models, to that thick, sticky mucus, which is so challenging. So if we could somehow not only help with CFTR, but also perhaps turn off that ENAC channel, decrease the amount of sodium resorption, that actually may rehydrate the airways. We know that this works in animals. So there are a couple different programs. This is getting a lot of attention from companies right now. Um, one of these uh, is a trial using VX371, which basically turns off that or inhibits that ENAC channel. And um, this study is actually ongoing. It's uh, most of the way enrolled. We should have data available later on this year. And this will be the, one of the, the first trials which will help provide some insight into the role of inhibiting ENAC. This specific trial that we're going to be looking at is one that's been tested in people who are already on Orcambi, with the question is, if you add this to Orcambi, does it help? There's another trial that's going to be starting that is not as related to Orcambi, but it actually decreases the number of ENAC channels. It actually binds to them and gets rid of some of those channels. So we'll know in the next year or two quite a bit about whether or not inhibiting or removing ENAC makes a big difference for mucociliary clearance. All right, how about number eight and seven? Now you're saying, why eight and seven at the same time? Truth there were so many in this area, I couldn't just make it one. We'd be here all day, so I made it eight and seven. So that's new anti-infectives. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of them, and this is only a, a few of the ones that are going on. Um, one of these is actually a trial that just ended, and it's called the Optimize Study, and this looked at what's the best way to treat a young person or an adult with CF when they first get pseudomonas. Right? That's always something that we pay extra attention to. We act right away to try to eradicate that. We've seen from previous trials that using inhaled tobramycin or inhaled as trianam can oftentimes eradicate that pseudomonas. This trial was looking and saying, if we added azithromycin to the toby from the very get-go, is that helpful? Is that worthwhile? This trial actually was originally scheduled to enroll 221 participants. It got stopped early um, a little bit early, about after 213 patients, because the answer was so clear that the study monitoring board looked at it and said, it doesn't make sense to keep going with this trial. We know the answer. And that is that there's an advantage when you first get pseudomonas to using both tobramycin and azithromycin, uh, because that those people who did that combination were sick a lot less. So this is just another way. It's, it's not a giant breakthrough, but it's another way of moving the ball forward and making sure that people have the best chance uh, when they're dealing with some of these infections. Number eight's a neat one. We've talked about this a little bit before, but I wanted to give you an update. It's called the IGNITE study. It uses a uh, molecule called gallium. So remember we've talked about before that in order to grow, bacteria needs iron. Iron is part of its growing process. Gallium is very similar to iron, but when bacteria takes up gallium, it's unable to grow. It actually kills the bacteria. So this study looks at giving IV infusions of gallium, a molecule that we've actually used in other parts of medicine and that we know can be safe, or that is safe, and to see whether or not it will particularly help um, by fooling the bacteria to take it up and killing some of this bacteria. The reason this is nice is because it doesn't matter how resistant the bacteria are. They need iron. So even if it's a very tough to treat bacteria, if some of these tougher things such as cepatia or abscessus, there's some evidence that this approach could work with that as well. So this trial is ongoing. It's about halfway enrolled. So either later this year or the beginning part of next year, we'll have some answers about the role of gallium in difficult to treat infections. Another one, and this is one of Preston's favorites, is with some of, he's been championing this, and he's, uh, it's, a, it's a very neat approach. So nitric oxide is a molecule that the body already uses for a lot of different things, but one of the things it does is to, uh, for its own defense against bacterial infection. There are ways to be able to have that as a purified gas that you can breathe. And so the thought was, well, what, if it works so well in low amounts, couldn't we use it at higher amounts to actually treat difficult to, to, to treat infections? So there's a trial beginning right now that's, that's supported by the CF Foundation. And, um, 
using this gas, and people, people uh, inhale it four times a day through nasal prongs for 10 days. And really what we're doing is to say, hey, can we reduce the amount of bacteria? Again, the reason that we're excited by this is because it can work for pseudomonas, but it can work for just about any type of difficult to treat infection. So it, it helps uh, potentially as another approach to some of these more challenging infections. And the last one I'll mention is that you'll be hearing about is um, the phosphomycin tobramycin study done by a company called Curex. We all are very familiar with inhaled tobramycin, right? We've got a bunch of different ways to do that, including dry powder. There's some evidence that adding phosphomycin, another molecule to tobramycin, can actually make tobramycin more potent. So you can use lower doses of tobramycin, meaning less side effects. It also extends the spectrum. It can treat other bacteria, such as MRSA. So this trial is actually beginning later on this year. It's going to be looking to see whether or not this combination is actually better than tobramycin alone. So um, we should know some more things about this probably by 2018, of whether or not this might be an additional approach to uh, some of our tough-to-treat infections. And the last one I'll mention, just because people have asked me about this, is for MRSA, about 25% of people with CF at some point have MRSA now. That there is a trial using an inhaled dry powder vancomycin that should be starting in the third quarter of 2017 to see whether or not we could use the same approach we do with inhaled tobramycin or inhaled uh, estreonam to treat MRSA using this device and this uh, molecule. All right, how about number six? This is, a, I think, a really neat study. I think in Bruce Marshall and I've talked about this is really changing in some ways our approach to research. Uh, I have to give credit to a couple of people like uh, Patrick Flume and Chris Goss and people who've done a great job of, of leading this. But really it's a trial which is going to help us figure out how long do we actually need to treat a pulmonary exacerbation for? Is it always two weeks of IV antibiotics? Right? That's like the magic number. But what's the data that supports that? So I'm just going to show you this trial, and once you understand it, you'll see how slick the design is. Basically, everybody in this trial is ongoing and, and, and enrolling actually ahead of schedule. Anybody who's admit, or I'm trying to admit, anybody who undergoes IV antibiotics for an exacerbation who decides to participate in this trial has another spirometry done about five to seven days after starting IV antibiotics with the question of, are they starting to get better? Because if they are, they get randomized to an early responder group, which means, hey, they're already looking like they're starting to respond. Do we really need to do 14 days of IV antibiotics or 14 days in the hospital, right? So that group is randomized to either 10 days or 14 days. And so the result of this is we'll be able to figure out that if you start to respond initially to IV antibiotics, it may be that you only need 10 days. That could be days and days and days less in the hospital, months and months less time in the hospital for people with CF. The other question that always comes up, and frequently it's in adults, is what if you're responding slowly? Do you need longer? So if at the end of that five to seven days you do your PFTs and you're really not showing much response, that group's being randomized to either 14 days or 21 days. And the question is, is there an advantage to going longer? Because what they'll look at afterwards is to, to check lung function two weeks after finishing these and to see is there a difference, which is the best approach. The reason this is so great, it's built right into normal care. It's things that we're doing anyway, right? Treating exacerbations, it happens every day in, in CF centers all around the country. But by using this trial that's supported by the CF Foundation, we're gonna figure out what's the best way to do, the most efficient way, which will hopefully get back to that, making life simpler. Uh, all right, number five, anti-inflammatory clinical trials. Bill mentioned this briefly about this whole area of inflammation. We know inflammation's trouble in cystic fibrosis, right? I've shown this slide a couple times before, but this is a, uh, from an article that talks about um, the uh, anti-inflammatory cascade in cystic fibrosis that makes your mind spin, and then when you look at the title, it's the simplified view of the C CF airway inflammatory response. <laughs> hmm. So how do we know inflammation's a big deal? Even before people start to have a lot of infections, people with CF when they're early in life, if you do bronchoscopy and look at their airways, they already have way more inflammation than they should. Also, when people have an infection, their inflammatory response is out of proportion. It's one of the things that actually causes more damages and causes scarring is because CF inflammation is overactive in response because it's not very efficient in clearing the bacteria. So one of the things that um, there's been some evidence for is that we could find the right amount of inflammation. You can't get rid of it altogether because it's important for fighting infection, but if you turn off that overreaction, the people may actually have less lung damage 
and recover more quickly. So there are no less than four trials and a fifth one that's right behind it, which are either ongoing or about to start, all looking at different ways of trying to find this sweet spot for inflammation. That sweet spot where you say, okay, not too much inflammation, but enough to help clear infection. Two of these are actually already going. You may have seen last week that Corbis announced the results of their phase two trial. And actually, it was a positive trial. It showed that they were able to, with their agent, to decrease the amount of inflammation that was present in sputum. And it was, it's an early trial, but there may be a little bit of clinical benefit as well. But all of this says, hey, guess what? We can control. We can try to find this sweet spot. So now we can move forward and try to look at some additional, uh, probably an additional study to say, can this make a difference for how frequently people are sick? So taxes is ongoing. That's about two-thirds of the way uh, enrolled. So these are the things that we'll be hearing about in 2017 and certainly in 2018 to understand about the role of inflammation. All right, number four. Um, the 661 trials reached the finish line. So, you know, I'd had this as number four, and then it was very fortuitous that last week there was the announcement about the results of these trials. So they really, most of them have reached the finish line. Let's, I, I added a couple of slides, so we're going to spend a little bit longer on this, just because I think it's so important to understand. Um, remember, the 661 trials are uh, basically one of the follow-ons to Orcambi. Or can be, um, was this combination of a corrector and a potentiator. Um, potentiators are things which, such as Kaleidico, which when the channel's up on the surface, it opens the, the CFTR protein up so the chloride can come out. The correctors, as both Preston and Bill have talked about, are things which, when the protein's not ready to be folded correctly and moved to the surface, these correctors bind to the protein, stabilize it, and allow that protein to go up to the surface where it can then be opened with Kaleidico, and that combination of Lumacaftor and Ivacaftor is what we call our Cambi. Well, what this VX661 is, and uh, Tezacaftor, is basically, in some ways, another version, a little better version of our Cambi. And that's because it's a combination which um, is, uh, and we'll talk through the details, but looks like it actually has better effect and less of some of the side effects that we've seen in the past with a small group of people with what can be. So let's just talk about these trials so you understand. This, all of these are really focused, because of the corrector part, focused on people that have F508-DEL, right? And so when they originally started these four different trials, they did almost every type of combination with F508-DEL. We did people that had two F508-DEL mutations, homozygous, the same ones who benefit from what can be. People who had one F508 DEL and a nonsense mutation. So that means just treating one F508 DEL mutation. Another study looking at the 661, if you have F508 DEL on one allele and a residual function on the other, and the other one was F508 DEL and gating mutations. And the two that were announced last week were the ones that looked at two mutations of F508 DEL, the F508 DEL homozygous, and those with an F508 DEL residual function. I will tell you that earlier this year that unfortunately, Although we weren't surprised by this, but the, the one that looked at it for F5 weight Dell for just a single mutation with a stop said, hey, we're going to have to get something stronger. And that's where the next generation stuff comes in. But the results that were announced last week, last week looked at the F5 weight Dell homozygous and F5 weight Dell residual function. So I'm just going to go through each of those so you sort of see what, what that showed and what it means. And then um, we'll, we'll bring it home with the last couple points. So for the 661, I'm going to say one more time, f 5 weight del homozygous for the 106 study. This was in people who were 12 years of age or older. That There was a big study. 256 people with CF received placebo. About 250, 248 received this Tezacaftor, as Preston mentioned. That's the, the, the drug name now for 661, so Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor combination. After six months, they compared the two groups. And here's what they found that the FEV1 and the people who were on the Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor had improved 4%, that's an absolute 4%, that they were sick 35% less of the time, that their quality of life score had improved about five points, and that anytime we see above four points, we say that's a real change. That's sort of the magic number. And that the other thing was that it was very well tolerated. So what does that mean? I think that what we're going to see, and this has to go through FDA review and everything, but really this Tezacaftor Ivacaftor is a better, a better version of Orcambi. It's focused for F5-weight-del homozygotes. It has a little larger FEV1 effect, a similar effect on exacerbations. From what we've seen so far, remember there was a subset of people 
perhaps about 15 to 20 percent of people that when they first started Rokambi, they would get this chest tightness for a while. And we'd always sort of ride through that and we would talk about it, but they haven't seen so far any of that with the Tezacaphter or Ivacaphter. So it eliminates that whole concern. It allows us to dive in even if people are sick. Um, obviously, there'll be continued safety monitoring and all that, but so far it's looked great. The other thing is it's a lot less complicated for interactions with other drugs. For people who have been through this, if you're on antifungals or oral contraceptives, it doesn't have some of those interactions that Arcambi did. We'll have to see what the FDA says, although it's hard to argue with the data. It looks great. And that the trial for looking at this in younger people, since I know that's usually the first question, is when does it go to the 6- to 12-year-olds? I'm going to get out ahead of this one, that that's already ongoing. The basis for this is, and as Preston mentioned, the other big thing is that this, this 661 or Tezacaptor Ivacaptor combination will form the basis for the next generation of more potent things. They're going to add one other drug to that. Those trials are already starting. And that's key to be able to say, hey, these first two work. They look good. Now we can really go um, for, the, for the full ball of wax. How about the other one? Just going to. Um, the other one was the 661-108 study, and um, this studied 250 patients with f 5 8 del and residual function. This was people who had f 5 8 del and the other one would have been one of these ones who maybe make pancreatic sufficiency. One, um, quickly, they basically, it was a little more complicated. Two months on, two months break, two months on again. Sometimes you got the combination with Tezacaftor and Ivacaftor. Sometimes you got Ivacaftor alone. Um, but here's the take-home message. After two months... The patients who had a combination of the Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, their lung function improved nearly 7%. Their quality of life improved 11 points. That's a whopping amount. Um, Ivacaptor alone, 5 and 10. That, that is actually worth... Um, so what does this mean? It means that we know that Ivacaptor and this combination for people that have f 5 8 Dell on the other side helps residual function mutations, particularly these 25. These 25 were the ones that were included in the trial, okay? And so that's the ones that the FDA will be looking at. But I think the take-home message is that probably in the future, and this has to go through regulatory part, but in the future, if you have F508DEL on one side and a residual function on the other side, you'll probably end up on Tezacaftor or Ivacaftor because it works a little better. If you have just the residual function mutation of one of these mutations and something else like a stop mutation, then you'll probably just end up on Ivacaftor alone. We'll see. We'll see about this. But this is exciting, right? We've been waiting for this. We thought it was true. We'd seen it in the dish. We finally have the data to be able to say, okay, let's get it to people so they can benefit. Um, the, the last one, number three, I'm actually going to go through quick. I cut this down, and that's because Bill already talked about this. If you're not on that 25 mutations, you're not one of the ones we're talking about, how are we going to make sure that people can benefit? There are a bunch of rare mutations out there. So as Bill mentioned, we're actually working right now to develop cell lines, to work with the FDA, to figure out how we can take results in the lab to be able to answer questions to say this predicts to help somebody in clinic. So that's uh, something we're going to be working on, particularly in April. Number two, I just think it's important to realize there's a lot going on in the CFTR modulator space, right? So that there's only the, not only the Vertex trials, but there's a bunch of other companies doing modulator trials. And so I've listed some of them here. The whole point is we want the best, um, best potential medicines coming forward. We want competition, right? And part of our job is to make sure that everything that has potential has an opportunity to move through and to move through quickly. And that leads to the number one, and that's the one that we've all been hinting about, this next generation of modulators. And this is going to be the thing which allows these things like Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, when added with some other drugs, to reach the, you know, everybody that has a single f 508 del allele, which is 87% of people with CF. And I'm just going to show you the last two slides are in the lab, why this is so exciting. So this is just looking in the lab with cells, Looking at the effect right there in the yellow bar of what Ivacaft or Clydeco does for people with G551D, there's about a 50% correction of CFTR function. We know that that's, in many ways, a magic number because we know how much Clydeco does for these patients. Now, how about if we study cells of people with two f 58 del uh, mutations, f 58 del homozygous? If we see or can be, we see it's maybe 25% correction. With these new next generation, this third drug that's added, remember the one plus one equals five? Here's the five. One plus one equals five. Six, six, one, 
plus one of these next generations, plus Ivacaftor, exceeds in the dish the effect of Kaleidico and G551D. That's why we say this could make such a transformational effect, have such a transformational effect. The other thing is, um, this would be potentially strong enough to treat people with a single F5 weight DEL allele. So if you just have one, even if the other size has stop mutation, here's that same pretty comparable to Kaleidico and G551D, right? So this is something that could potentially treat 86, 87 percent of all people with cystic fibrosis. So this is exciting. This is really the thing that's going to be transformative in the upcoming years. This is not just a someday thing. These trials are already going. 440 and 152, two of the next generation modulators are currently being tested. There's another two which trials, whose trials will be starting very soon. If you're interested, go to the clinical trial finder. You can find all of these. Um, that, that's cff.org slash find. That, um, I know I covered a lot pretty fast. I think you can see what now why Preston said this is the best story in medicine. We could have come up probably with another 10 that would have been just as good. But these 10 are really exciting. They're going to be the things that are going to make a difference both now and in years to come. They're not a someday thing. They're something that are going to be helping people in the upcoming months, upcoming years, and then really transforming CF in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bill, Mike, thank you all. What a, what a great presentation. And uh, I know that everyone in the audience uh, really appreciated that. Uh, does everyone know how to submit questions? I'm a little worried that if you're not smart enough to figure out the cff.cnf.io, they didn't want your question. I want to make well, sure that that's not... There's going to be breakouts to ask questions tomorrow. And there'll be breakouts, breakouts tomorrow, tomorrow as well. So we're going to have to boot, scoot, and boogie. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> we're running a little bit behind. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to um, ask Mike uh, this question. I'm a physician. My son has CF, and I'm going to abbreviate the question. But he has a G551D with F508 Dell on the other side. Uh, well, is it better for him to stay on Ivacaftor long term, or is Rocambi or Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor a better drug for him going forward? Yeah. Well, I think we always go with data, right? So we try to say, well, what's the data tell us? And so if you looked, um, the data suggests that the Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor combination, if you have G551D on one side and f 5 down on the other, that it actually is a little better to use the combination. So I think eventually the answer is people will use the combination. Obviously, right now the FDA needs to uh, to look at that. That takes a couple of months at least. Actually, it takes about six months because the, the um, Vertex will put this together. I tell you, putting together a new drug application is amazing. Oftentimes it has more than a million pages, literally a million pages in the application. Um, the story I've heard, anyway, I'll go to... The story I've heard is that one of the applications before it was electronic actually filled the entire back of a... Of a station wagon just to be dropped off one application. But anyway, that would be reviewed at the end, probably towards the end of this year. And I think there's a good chance that that combination will work better for those people. Um. Thanks, Mike. And Bill, there's a, a, there's a couple of questions about this for nonsense mutations. And <clears throat> they're wondering if other CF, <clears throat> excuse me, if other CFTR modulators would ever be used in in addition to a nonsense uh, mutation therapy? I think that's a, that's a good question, and, and this is one of the things that we're now finding out, that after you fix the nonsense mutation, you don't get a normal protein. Many times you get a protein that is not quite normal and needs a modulator added to it. So the nonsense mutations are going to probably require a nonsense therapy and a modulator. And I think now that the modulators are coming out down the road and we're seeing how well they work, there's a very good chance that we'll be able to boost the level beyond what we would get with a nonsense mutation therapy alone. Okay, Mike, um, can we publish a list of each mutation, what treatments we hope are going to work for them? Maybe you can just talk about Clinical Trial Finder and how that may work uh, today. Yeah, so um, I think maybe a couple questions in there. One of these that might be in there is for people, for instance, I flashed up that one picture that said, hey, these are the residual function mutations that are, and I talk to people taking pictures. You can get that list by going to the clinical trial finder and saying, looking under 661108. 
and that list is on there for the ones that were studied. I think part of this question as well is, is to say, okay, what if can we list every mutation and to say what we think is going to work? I think it's a little premature to do that right now. A lot of the work that Bill is, is doing is to be able to hopefully eventually be able to do that and to provide. What we know right now oftentimes is in, embedded in different clinical trials. So one of the approaches is to go to the clinical trial and fire to put your mutation in or to, to, to use the screening tool to see what trials are ongoing. Um, there's also CFTR2, which is the website sp uh, sponsored, it's done by Johns Hopkins, sponsored by the CF Foundation that provides a lot of detail about every one of the mutations. And then what I would say is stay tuned, this is gonna be going on, but probably at some point it starts to get sort of complicated. It might be best to talk with your physician, talk with your team a little bit because you can only do so much um, and you wanna make sure that, that what you're seeing is most reflective. Does that sound fair? I think yeah. it's fair. I would say CFTR2 is working on these questions, but if you go online now, you'll find 322 or 326 mutations. That doesn't mean they're not working on the others. It means that those have come far enough for them actually to put them on the website. So just be aware that your mutation might not be on there. It's still in the large database. So Bill, this one may be for you. Um, with respect to CRISPR-Cas9, um, there's billions of cells in the body. Uh, how does gene editing specifically target and tackle a set of desired cells successfully? That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. And this is something that we're now facing. In order to do gene editing, we need to do gene delivery because we need to deliver the CRISPR-Cas9. So developing those packaging molecules, those packaging um, vectors to put the gene editing enzymes into and then having those home in on lung cells, on pancreas cells, on bile duct cells, on gut cells, is really something that needs to be done. And this is why Preston said this is a long-term project. Because if we really want to cure CF once and for all, we can't just go after the lung. We need to go after all the tissues which are affected by CF. There's a lot of companies working on this, and there's a lot of progress being made, but we still have a long way to go. Bill, this may be for you or Mike. Uh, I have two children with a stop mutation and a missense mutation. Have there been any initial looks at these combinations in laboratory tests? So, actually, the missense mutations, Delta F508 is a missense mutation. So those other missense mutations also behave similarly to Delta 508 in many ways. The protein is made. The protein is abnormal. And one of the goals of the therotyping project will be to find out which missense mutation will respond to, to the drugs that we now have and the new drugs coming down the line. So having a missense mutation which is rare means that there may be a possible therapy for those mutations with current drugs, or it may mean we need to add new drugs, and that's why the therotyping project is so important to determine which of those, which of those possibilities comes and will be possible. Um, let's see, there are a lot of great questions here. Um, can a carrier's intestinal cell samples be helpful in research, or do you need the sample from a cf -er? I think that right now, the samples from individuals with CF will be much more useful, because the signal from the normal gene in a carrier makes it very difficult to determine exactly how the mutated gene is responding. So, although we may find ways to use carriers in the future, right now our main focus is on cells from individuals with CF that we can use to, to, st to study these kinds of drugs. And Mike, uh, how can we get into trial when your child is one of those 5%? He is a non-F508 DEL. So, um, I think one of the key things, we've talked a lot about genotypes, we've talked a lot about mutations, right? But think about all those in the top 10, there was a bunch of those that had absolutely nothing to do with the type of mutation you have. And so I think one of the things, first of all, is to say, okay, if I really have a rarer mutation that right now isn't, doesn't have a modulator trial, um, or if it's a nonsense mutation or whatever, there's a lot of other things. The ENAC inhibitors, um, when they come around, they, those are things which work for anybody. Um, anyway, there's, think about all those other, uh, classes of therapies which can make a difference until we screen, get through some of these screens and start identifying some of the read throughs. Um, this actually is uh, almost for Chris Penland over there <laughs> drinking iced tea, seeing that he's in the South. Uh, but uh, maybe it'll go to Bill. How can we help families understand their mutations? 
Our clinic is awesome, but time is limited to really educate. Is this not CFTR2? I think it's CFTR2, but it goes beyond CFTR2. We recognize that 10 years ago, people kind of knew their mutation, but didn't really care about it. And now there's this big resurgence about what is the mutation that you have, how does it work, what, will, what type of therapies will benefit it. And at the foundation, we're really working on getting that message out in a broader and more complete way. So this is something we'll be working on with our communications team over the next year, trying to put together better information for families and people with CF to read, and hopefully do a better job of communicating all the nuance that now is actually coming to the clinic. It used to be all in the laboratory, and now it's right in the clinic and right in people's lives. Can I just say one other thing on that? I think if you feel like, hey, I've got a mutation that not many people know about, don't, you're not alone. There's actually, um, you know, there are numerous mutations, over a thousand mutations that five people or less in the world have. All right, say that again, over a thousand mutations that five people or less in the world have. So there's, there's a lot of, and part of this is uh, the therotyping will be to get some of these rare mutation cells to be able to answer the questions, how does this respond? It's gonna take a little while. So I was saying a combination of talking with your own physician, seeing what's available, CFTR2, usually you can start to understand which, what the approach is gonna be. So, uh, Mike, ENAC question, is that independent of the CF mutation? Um, so, yes. I, I think if I, we know that CFTR... If there's an ENAC-based yeah. ENAC therapy, therapy, would that be so, effective regardless so, of your mutation? So the answer is probably. Um, we, we know that um, ENAC uh, is a problem in all of cystic fibrosis, right? So that if we could actually, if, if, if inhibiting it, and thinking about turning off some of that sodium resorption we saw in the video, that could potentially help anybody. Now there might be a little bit of evidence that if your CFTR restoration is, is there, it might actually make it even more effective. But the short answer is yes. This, we're hoping that ENAC would be something we could approach no matter what your mutation is. Bill, I've got two really difficult questions, so brace yourself, okay? Um, so what is a realistic timeline for bringing a nonsense mutation therapy uh, to people with cystic fibrosis? I think it depends on the type of therapy. Small molecules, like our Cambian Kaleidico, are going to take time to develop, just as Kaleidico and Arcambi took, 15 years or so, or probably several years in. So it's hard to say exactly when, but it might be eight years or more. Other, other therapies, like RNA delivery, possibly RNA therapy, RNA correction, could come much quicker because the, the developmental path for those is different than small molecules. So that's happy. kind of a, a, a guess, but we really don't know. Nonsense mutations are tough. 10% of all mutations for rare genetic diseases are nonsense. And so far, no company has come up with a therapy to specifically target nonsense mutations. So we're really in a, in a great situation because if we can do this in CF and we can identify these molecules, we think they'll have huge implications for many, many other rare diseases. But it is going to take time. And it's, I wish I could say it would be two years, five years down the line. It's probably going to be longer. And then the second one, Bill, thank you. Um, what are the downsides of gene editing? It seems so sci-fi. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I always love sci-fi. <laughs> The downside of gene editing is safety <clears throat> and delivery. Those are two things we need to overcome. You don't want to go into the cell, and the, and the video was very nice because it showed one spot, it fixed the spot, nothing else was touched. But we know that there are other spots in the genome which can be affected by the gene editing enzymes. And if that was in an oncogene, or a very important gene that might affect how those cells function, there could be side effects. And we need to be very careful about making sure we don't cause problems when we fix a problem. The other downside for gene editing, I think, is that the delivery component of gene editing is probably going to be <coughs> the delay. It's probably going to be harder to get gene delivery to put the editing enzymes in than to actually figure out how to use the gene editing enzymes to fix the mutation that we want to fix. So it's very promising. It's incredibly exciting. As I said five years ago, people weren't even talking about this, and now it's everywhere but there's still some really difficult hurdles we need to overcome. And that's why I think it's really important to kind of couch expectations. We're not just saying, let's work on gene editing, let's find a solution. 
While we're working on gene editing, we're also making better therapies for, to treat the complications, we're bringing forward modulators, and we're really kind of taking a holistic approach at this. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Mike, regarding transplantation, are there any new anti-rejection meds being worked on or other therapies for transplantation? So there's been a, a bunch of new, newer immunosuppressives that have been proposed. And I think one of the things that we're hoping to do is, you know, the transplant community is actually very different than the CF community because we work, the research community tends to work together. And uh, having done a decent amount of lung transplant at Johns Hopkins, the one thing that's every center, center tends to do its own thing. And so there's not a chance. So, you know, for instance, even the question about inhaled cyclosporin, which was something that people are still wondering about, um, a couple of the other newer uh, immunosuppressives. In organized systems, much like the TDN, which would allow us to be able to really test those rather than each center doing their own thing, could be one of our biggest contributions. So it's, right now it's less to do with the, the pipeline and a little bit more to do with some of the getting organized to test some of the newer things that are being proposed. And we, we hope to, to fill that gap. I know Dr. Al Farrow is already thinking about this, wherever Al is. Al will figure it out. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hey, Bill, are there any, is there any thought in researching the regeneration and sort of the allowing regeneration of damaged lung tissue? Yeah, so there's a big area in regeneration, and this is something that, the, that uh, Jed Mahoney will talk about in the stem cell session tomorrow. There are ways of taking stem cells and basically forming stem cells from your blood. Draw a blood sample, turn those blood cells into stem cells, and then grow those stem cells under certain conditions which actually make them lung cells, or liver cells, or pancreas cells. So one possibility, and we're thinking about this a lot, and we've got a number of investigators working on it, is to try to find ways of taking those cells that we grow and develop in the laboratory and put them back into the, own, into the own person's lung. So if you could do that and use gene editing to correct the cells before you put them back, then what you'd be doing is restoring the lung function with the person's own cells that no longer have the CFTR mutation. So that's a very promising technology. We've been doing it in bone marrow transplantation without the gene editing for a number of years. Moving to the lung is going to be difficult, but there's a lot of people now that are quite interested in using these same technologies for other tissues, like the heart, the kidney, and various tissues that degenerate in, in, in other genetic disorders. Thanks, Bill. I'm going to answer this question for Bruce Marshall since he's sitting in the, but this is his space and he does an amazing job with it. Uh, as these new therapies come forward, I think the implication is we need, we need to take away some therapies. So, you know, what will be the role of existing therapies and how will we know when we can withdraw them? And the important work of the registry is going to help with that, including some new clinical trial designs that, uh, Dr. Marshall and his team are doing. STOP was, was one of those where we will use it's called comparative effectiveness research, where we will actually be doing studies to see can you take away, what is the optimal therapeutic regimen that's least invasive and expensive for people with CF. So that is the future to a large extent of what we will be doing, and uh, no one's going to no one's going to fund that other than ourselves, but we know that that's something that we're going to need um, to, to work on. And then the... Um, there's, a, I think, an excellent question here. I'm curious to hear what the researchers are doing with cloud computing analytics, using technology to assist in mapping cures, therapies, disease management, et cetera. I, I've got, we tried to get, we, we tried to work with Watson about a, two years ago, and it didn't work out exactly as we'd planned. Bill, do you want to say anything to that? I will say that we're probably not doing as much in that area as we'd like to. One of the things we are doing is undertaking an initiative to sequence a large number of genomes of people with CF so that we can now look at differences and variations in their sequences, not just in the CFTR gene, but in other genes as well. And so we're just now looking to hire someone at the CFFT lab that is well versed in big data sets, analyzing large information, information um, um, sets where we can start picking out variations that will be helpful to understand both the cause of disease, say liver disease or diabetes, CF-related diabetes, as well as therapies that might actually treat those diseases specifically in the individuals that are at high risk. So we are starting to get into that space. It's probably something we could do more of. But as, as Preston said, using the kind of the Watson-type computers has proven difficult. 
So we're going to end. I'm going to ask Mary to come up because there's a request from uh, our question, uh, from the questions. It says, some of us recently heard your team did a happy dance <laughs> to celebrate the recent VX661 success in the hope that it provides for the future. Is there any chance that we can see that dance and celebrate with you? Uh, so I'm going to ask everybody to stand right, up. Let's go, let's go. Uh, is there any music? Can you all pipe some music in? Mary, you're going to come that's over that's here in the middle. Oh, and the reason I'm asking oh, Mary to come up is Mary is the happy dancer. All right. <laughs> we can be we'll in the hallways Mary. and Mary and her team will be doing the happy dance. <laughs> and we know that there's been some success somewhere in access and policy. I need, uh, uh, Chris, any thumbs up for music? Any? It's coming. I think we're getting ready to get, have y'all got your, are y'all ready for a happy dance? <laughs> Does it need to be and it's not going to be very long. We're not going to have to do this for long. Oh, uh, we could do the the, the boot and scoot oh, and boogie. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't But I think a happy dance for now is good. Oh, this is going to regret this. Or should we just just go? Looks like they're watching. You guys need to dance too. Like this. Come on, dance! I don't see people dancing. Come on! Happy, 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 Footloose. It was Kevin Bacon in Footloose. And what did he say? He said, Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season, and this is the season to dance. And you just saw it right there. We're going to take a 15-minute break now. We're still on time. We weren't going to cut this short at all. We do want you to understand that with the break that's going to occur from 3 to 3.30 in your program, it's going to just be cut to a 15-minute break from 3.15 to 3.30. We're still on schedule. Have fun. Yeah.